If you'll open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul writes this second epistle to Timothy, the second one that's kept for us in God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, this is the Word of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Last week, I visited the cemetery in my mom's hometown where many of her family are buried. I learned more of my own legacy as my aunt told me of my great-great-grandmother who was a charter member of the church in that little town where my great-uncle was buried last month. Saw the grave of my great-grandmother and I remember these two women, believe it or not. My great-grandmother who was a godly woman who took my mom to church when she was a little girl. My grandfather didn't go then, he was not saved then, but later he became a Christian and a godly man and then my own mom. So when I read these verses that Paul wrote to Timothy, I thought of how important is this godly legacy. As Christians, we seek to leave with those who follow us a legacy of sincere faith. If that's true of all of us as Christians, how much more true should it be of us as Christian parents, moms and dads, that we would seek to leave to our children first and foremost a sincere faith. That's what I saw in the text, and we want to think about that. As Paul mentions, Timothy's spiritual legacy, as he encourages him, if you continue to read the letter, as he encourages him to continue in that same faith. I want to begin with a little bit of background. If we were to go back to Acts chapter 14, we would see that on Paul's missionary journeys, one of the cities he visited was Lystra. It was quite an exciting time in Lystra. People were being saved. Lives were being changed. The power of God was in evidence, but also there was lots of misunderstanding. And finally, Paul was stoned. Do you remember that? He left. Went to other cities, continued the ministry, and then he doubled back before he went back to Jerusalem. And there in Lystra, he ministered. Acts chapter 16, Paul returns. And there he is introduced to Timothy. Why he didn't meet Timothy the first time, we don't know. But what we do know is that Paul had ministry and had built some relationship with Timothy's mother and grandmother on that first missionary trip. And when Paul comes again, Timothy is commended to him and Paul takes Timothy with him and Timothy ministers with Paul and then continues to pastor and minister. They become close enough that Paul refers to him as his dear son in the faith. He entrusts him as he would leave him from time to time at different places to continue work that Paul had started so Paul could go on to new places 
and later they would rejoin that ministry and that relationship continued until Paul's death. And that brings us to 2 Timothy because this is the last letter Paul wrote. He wrote from the Roman prison and sent to Timothy. The most personal of Paul's letters and scholars tell us that shortly after this letter was written, Paul was executed. I want to focus your attention on verse 5 where Paul talks about Timothy's sincere faith. What is sincere faith? The Greek word is a word that means without hypocrisy. And one commentator gives this definition, a sincere faith is not hypocritical and play acting, but shows itself to be genuine by changed life. If you remember, the word hypocrite originally referred to those who were actors on the stage. They were called hypocrites because they would assume a role and play a part, but it was not really them. A good, decent person could play the role of a thief, and thus he was a hypocrite playing that role. In time, it became a pejorative term to speak to people who would pretend to be one way and really yet were something else. I note two things that Paul mentions about Timothy's faith. He said, I first saw this faith in your mother and your grandmother. Timothy possessed this same genuine, sincere, vibrant faith that Paul had first noted in his mother and his grandmother. I think of my great-great-grandmother and my aunt, who's just four years older than me. Uh, we were talking about Grandma Wenders. That's her name. And when I saw her, she was old. She was blind. She dipped snuff. She's a Christian, but she still dipped snuff. I'm glad most of us have moved away from that. <laughs> She's in one of them old high wheel, uh, wheelchairs, you know, in a dark house because it was hot and no air conditioning. She was 95 when she died. Uh, when I remember her, it was probably when she was about 93. And she loved to touch you. She wanted to bring, they called my mom, C. Ann. They said, C. Ann, bring, bring the little one up here. And they'd drag me up there and she'd just pat on you. Oh, isn't he fine? <laughs> and when she smiled, she had a big gold tooth. And the rest of them brown. I was scared to death of the woman. <laughs> I remember when she died going to the funeral home. But what I didn't know until the other day was that she was a charter member of the Church of Christ in Calvary City. My great grandmother, with all the tragedies in her life, was such a faithful witness in standing at her grave. I remember that sweet woman. It was like the Holy Spirit said, you're blessed, boy. You're blessed. Not with money and not with fame, because who in the world, even here, knows where Calvert City, Kentucky is? But God did. And there was the gravestone of her little girl who burned to death at five. That's enough to drive you away from church unless you really know the God who's there. And the day she died was a Sunday morning. Her dress was laid out on the bed and her brooch beside it that she wore. And the neighbor who lived next door noticed she didn't get on the little church van to go to church and he said, Miss Ora always went to church. 90 years old. Never missed. Reminds me of somebody else I know. And he had a key, he went in, and she was laying on the couch in her slip, ready to put on her dress to go to church. And she lay down on the couch and died. Not a bad way to go to church, is it? 
I always said Mama Driver went to church for real that Sunday. Names that don't mean anything to you, but they mean everything to me. My granddaddy, who I didn't know any other way, but being a hard worker and a good man. And as I grew and got in ministry, he loved to visit with me and pick my brain about the Bible because he read the Bible all the time. Wanted to talk about Jesus all the time. And my mama. So when Paul talks about Eunice and Lois and this sincere faith, I kind of relate to that. I didn't get here by myself. I've teased you and told you that when you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. And when you see us where we are, we didn't get here by ourselves. And this is a day, a good day, to be reminded of how important it is that we live our lives so that what truly matters is seen and can be followed by those who come after us. Second thing I noticed that Paul mentions about this sincere faith is that it lived in these women, lived in Timothy. One translation says it dwelt in. Permanent residence. One writer put it this way, sincere faith was not just an occasional visitor in Lois and Eunice, but was a permanent residence an abiding presence exerting its influence for good on these godly role models as well as on Timothy himself. Paul says, Timothy, what I see alive and at work in you is the same faith I saw in your mother and your grandmother when I preached the gospel, when I discipled them before I ever knew you. Now, you and I know that it's impossible to pass on what we do not possess. So if we don't possess a sincere faith, how can we pass it on to someone else? And I ask myself, even as I ask you, do you have a sincere faith in Jesus Christ? Do you confess that you're a sinner without hope apart from the saving work of Christ on Calvary's cross? Have you, have I, by faith, received God's gift of forgiveness and a new life in Jesus Christ? And has that relationship with Christ changed our lives? It's not something we put on when we walk in the door of the church and take off when we get in the car afterward. No, this was a sincere faith that was so evident, so clear. And Paul said, that's the same thing I see in you, Timothy. And Paul mentioned these two women who were special influences in Timothy's faith. These godly influences who happened to be his mother and grandmother. But in all the years I've preached to you, you know I've told you about different ones who've been godly influences in my life. Sunday school teachers, coaches, professors, what I'd call plain old church members. One of the earliest memories I have is of Papa Duncan, retired high school principal. White hair, tall, and I was about Liam's size, except I wasn't like Liam. I was scared to death of my own shadow. Timid and introverted, but we'd come to church, and there was this big, imposing man who would bend down and smile and shake hands with a little fella and say, welcome, I'm so glad you're here this morning. Did it make a difference? I would say so. I still remember it, just like it was yesterday. Do you think that matters? Yeah, it matters because he did that with every child that walked through that door on Sunday morning. We mattered. It wasn't just the big people that mattered. We mattered. And because he also stood up and gave his testimony in church, I figured that what he said mattered. 
And that if he had a relationship with Jesus and he could care about somebody like me, then maybe all this stuff did matter. He did have an influence. Who are the godly influences in your life? The older I get, the more I thank God for a mom and dad who stuck to their guns. Boy, did I bark and carp and whine and gripe. But I'm glad they didn't listen to me. If they had, I wouldn't be here today. You see, they had a sincere faith. I didn't say they were perfect in it, but they were sincere. They really believed that. And in their house, there were things that we did. And as long as you lived there, you did it. You went to church. You didn't beg off. And it wasn't just church on Sunday morning. It's Sunday school and church. At my house, church meant Sunday school and church. And when there was trouble in the church, Daddy said, you can go to any church that I approve, but you will go to Sunday school and church and Sunday night just like we do now. And I did. Gone away to school for a year, came back. I'd been out on my own. I washed my own clothes. I fixed my own meals. I was independent. One year college under my belt, I knew more than most people. But when I came back and lived at their house, curfew was still 1030. I said, Dad, I'm 19 years old. I've been on my own. I'll be 20 before long. He says, I don't care if you're 40. In this house, we go to bed at 1030. So you're going to be in the house and the door locked and ready to go to bed at 10.30 because I have to work tomorrow. I thought that was so stupid. I miss my daddy. And I love my mama who they said, when you live here, that's just how we live here. And when you sat down to the table, you didn't eat till you said grace. That's just how it was. I've been reprimanded more than once for violating that rule because I could get a piece of chicken in my mouth before, before grace could be started. But I was reminded that we don't eat here till we say grace. You think those things aren't important, but they are. They're gentle, loving reminders of a sincere faith that says there are things in life that are more important than our creature comforts and our selfish comforts because we love Jesus. Think about those godly influences in your life. It may have been your mother, your grandmother. Elizabeth Elliot said that a mother's primary disciples are those who are seated around her table. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, said, Never could it be possible for any man to estimate what he owes to a godly mother. And a Jewish proverb says, One mother achieves more than a hundred teachers. All you got to do is talk to your school teacher friends, and they'll tell you they can tell the kids who come from good homes. They're easy to spot. Those who are loved and disciplined with love. Especially those where there's a sincere faith being practiced. Perfect kids? No, but you can tell the difference. And so before we leave, I want to ask you, upon whom are you being a godly influence? What legacy are you leaving behind? Especially to your children and your grandchildren. What are you leaving them? If it's well, it can be squandered overnight. It can be lost in a heartbeat. If it's reputation and a name, 
Oh, that name can be marred and sullied by one thoughtless act. If it's some big dream you have that you pass on to them, dreams can end up being disappointments. But if you pass on a sincere faith, if you live before them a godly life pointing them to Jesus Christ, then you leave to them that which lasts forever. Could it be said of you? The faith I see in your son, the faith I see in your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter, I I see that same faith in you. I see that same sincerity of love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I see that same commitment to do the things that Christ would have you do. Is that what you're leaving behind? Is it what you long to leave behind? You see, the day will come when my name will just be a name in a long list of preachers who have served here. May even be folks who look at that name in some book and don't even remember. Kids don't remember. Grandkids don't remember. But if God has used me to build a sincere faith in you that's passed on and on, that sincere faith will still be here. And that's what matters. I promise you, my great-grandmother never, ever had any idea her sincere faith would live in her great-grandson. I want it to keep living in you and me and the next generation and the next generation until Jesus comes. So that what's remembered about Bisco Presbyterian is not the preacher's name or any of our names, but that that church has stood for generations on the sincere faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that's the legacy we leave, we will have been successful. May God make it so. Amen.